good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll get started with our next session. So for this session, we have Tom West. Tom West is a certified planner with the American Planning Association and holds a master's degree in planning and public administration. Before starting his own firm, West worked in municipal and county planning specializing in local land use and conservation projects. Tom shifted into a consulting role after opening his firm Greener Planning, which provides planning services throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Most projects incorporate geospatial solutions customized to help highlight key issues, illustrate meaningful trends, or provide essential information to assist decision makers. Great, good afternoon everybody. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about return on environment. Um, uh, just to, to the easiest way to convey it, it's answering a key question that we in the community planning field have, have often had, and that is, what is nature worth? It's been a question that um, originally it was, it was phrased because counties, municipalities wanted to invest in open space and natural areas. And there was a lot of good reason to do it for water quality, air quality, well-being. But they also realized that the dollar drives a lot of decisions, especially in local government. And about 20 years ago or so, there was this methodology developed to really determine what is nature worth. So if you think of it that way, it gets a little bit easy to understand why we're doing it and, and how it works. We often start off with an exercise. So this is a just a wooded lot, four, four and a half acres about deciduous and evergreen trees, an understory. Um, so the question we phrase to our audience is, what do you think services are provided by this? We call them natural system services, sometimes ecosystem services. But what do you think a wooded lot does in terms of benefiting the community? Just two or three answers would be great. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Can you repeat that for the online audience? They can't hear. Oh, OK. So if you just repeat what he said, they can hear you. Very good. OK, so the, the first response was carbon sequestration. One more? Wildlife habitat. Wildlife habitat. Great. One more. What, does, what do woodlands do? Or let me phrase it another way. What happens if they're not there and it's, and it's changed? Okay. And the runoff. runoff, great, a good one. So stormwater runoff. So those are great answers um, and really important. But what we find is that often in the decision-making process, none of those are factored into decisions. So essentially we're saying that it doesn't have any value. And um, that's, that's a real problem because we know it does in the, in the development community, especially I, I sit in a lot of land use review meetings and we often say, what's the value of uh, this development for schools or roads? And we tie dollar values to it, but rarely do we look at natural system services and that's important because if mother nature did write an invoice, it would be something like this. So that four acre lot essentially generates in terms of natural system services, which Mother Nature's listed here, generates about $10,000 every year. Um, that's every year, so it accrues every year, and, it's an and there's minimal maintenance with it. Um, so it's, it's a big asset to our economy that's often overlooked. So the reason we do ROE is we want to change that. We want to bring that to the, to the important decision-making processes, and we'll look at some of those. That's just an image of it. I'm, I'm going to go through a few slides because we have a short um, presentation today, but hopefully this will be online and you'll be able to see it. So how is this information used? What applications do, do we see it used for? I already mentioned its original use was for um, justifying open space. So counties, municipalities spend an enormous amount of money on open space, and they wanted to know What's the balance? Is the return on that? Um, so Carbon County just finished theirs in 
2019 and just passed a grant referendum to fund open space. So that's a real success story. Um, most of the counties in Southeast PA have, have this analysis done. So that, that's one of the uses. Another one is it's, it helps guide um, land use policy. So most counties have a comprehensive plan or zoning. Um, we frequently see it used for that, such as the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission right around here, uh, Lehigh Valley Planning Commission and others. And then it's also used to help identify natural resource inventories. It's, this is kind of a newer thing. So we've seen that this methodology is useful to really assess wetlands, um, watersheds, uh, woodlands, riparian areas. When I say riparian, I mean stream buffers, things like that. So a number of agencies, watershed groups, land trusts, um, have, have used this technology to do that inventory and not just to say what it is, but how much is it worth every year? And we'll look at some of those numbers, which is pretty important. And then I did mention land development review. It's, that's something we're seeing more and more of. So we don't see just the numbers, but we see maps. And I'll show you some of those uh, because this is GIS day and we all like maps and we like to see how that information can be used. So we'll look at a couple of ways that's used in that, how it's transferred to that. So this is a map of um, the Kittatinny Ridge, which is part of South Central Pennsylvania. It runs diagonally through the state. This is where we do a lot of our work, not all of it, but most of it. So this map is showing where the little red dots are, where which counties we've already completed across the ridge. The stars are municipalities or land trust groups. So we're, we've got most of them done. We're talking, we're doing one now in Berks County and Schuylkill County we're in discussions with, so we're hoping to cover them all. The map, greenish, yellow, blue, uh, I'll look at that a little bit later with you. That's the return on environment mapping. So we essentially take those values, create a GIS layer out of it, drape it on a map, and then it becomes much more powerful. You can zoom in, you can see what's going on in my neighborhood, in a watershed, wherever you're interested. Um, so that becomes a much more useful tool for decision making beyond just the numbers we're looking at now, different areas and, and break it down and, and um, Make, it, make that information meaningful to people making decisions. So how do we get to these numbers? What, you know, I mentioned those numbers, $10,000. How do we get to that? Um, we already looked at natural system services, stormwater runoff, habitat, uh, air quality or carbon sequestration and, and other things. So we have measures for that and, and I'll show you how we do that in a little bit more detail in a future slide. We also measure local recreation. So we have formulas for that. We, we look at um, surveys that are done and we measure the amount of participation in like hiking and kayaking and things like that. And then we look at how much people spend on that. So there's lots of good information on that. So we could take that information and combine it and come up with a relatively consistent number that rep reflects what the population's using for outdoor recreation. And, how that is, how um, nature and open space are contributing to the economy. We also look at healthcare savings. This is kind of a newer one where healthcare has become an expensive thing for all of us. But we do know that similar to outdoor recreation, people who are, who are active, who exercise, there's cost savings. The CDC has uh, research on this and we know based on the amount of um, time someone is recreating or using outdoor recreation like twice a week or once a week or twice a month, we have numbers on that on healthcare savings. So we can, we can generate another number. And then the last one is um, proximity to open space. So we're all familiar with that. If you have beachfront, your property is pretty valuable, right? Waterfront, maybe not as much and then further away. So that's, that's that number. And really, why are we doing this? It's because, again, I already touched on this. It addressed the true cost during key decision-making process. When I say true cost, or um, Penn State did a study, full cost accounting, that was really instrumental and opened pe people's eyes up about what are these costs 
that we're not addressing. And, and this is part of that is to address when we change na a natural area to a developed area, we just want to know what those costs are. It's not to say don't do it necessarily, but let's be aware of it's not a free deal. Um, this is a slide that just shows the Kinnatinny Ridge website um, where you can go to, and, and they've, they've really bought into return on environment. So they have pages on their website that talk about what, what is ROE? Why do you do it? What's the methodology? Um, I, talk, I just gave you a quick view of it here, but if you go to that website, you can read a lot more detail. And then all the studies that have been completed, you'll see the reports that are done, the mapping, and, and some of the outreach material that goes with it. But that's the place to go to find uh, other details on it. So I mentioned natural system services. Um, this is where we talk about GIS a little bit more. So how do we get that number? The wheel on the right is showing um, what people consider natural system or ecosystem services. And there's a lot of um, agencies that have, have used this in different ways. Essentially, they're attaching a, a, a dollar value to that for the reasons I stated. In the past, we did it for intrinsic value because it's open space is nice and nature's nice, right? And it was the quality of life. But again, if you're in planning uh, realms, they say, that's great, but this is my property and there's a dollar value with it. So we need to come back and say, there's also a dollar value to the impacts from your property if you develop it. So we take those services. Um, we also use GIS. We use a land cover data set. And these, th this whole model is based on the type of land cover. We looked at woodlands. So woodlands are important. Riparian areas are really valuable. Uh, meadows are important. Farming's important. And they all have a different, um, we call them eco price, a different value for that type of land cover that's there. And the eco prices are based on a lot of research in different areas of the country, mostly in the mid-Atlantic. So we don't go out and measure it ourselves. We use that reference material. We attach it to the GIS land cover type, and then we can derive based on the size of it and the different types of eco prices, what does that measure out to be? So we have land cover data, eco prices, we match them together in our models and spits out the results, including the mapping. Uh, this is just a slide of our one of our models in, in ArcGIS Pro. So there's about a dozen of them. Um, again, the fundamental thing is land cover data, but we also bring in wetlands, woodlands, uh, a number of layers. But mostly the numbers are based on different types of land cover. So we process it using Arc, ArcGIS to, to generate the results. This is showing... The results, just, we just did this one last month for Berks County. Berks Nature is a conservancy there. So this is a, a listing of the total numbers by the type of ecosystem service. So this adds up to about $8.5 million per year for Berks County. Um, and you can see it's broken down by the different types of services. Stormwater is usually a big one. Uh, habitat in this area is really big. Berks County still has a lot of forested land. So that generates a, a, a lot of score from that. But you can, this is another way to look at those numbers and it's helpful sometimes because it might be a, um, a water quality, someone, a water supplier interested in it and they wanna know what's the benefit of maintaining their woodlands and, that, and they can see it here and, and use that for their discussions and their decisions. Um, this is an interesting graph that shows for the counties we've done over the last dozen years, what are the total costs in ecosystem services for each of the counties? And these numbers are based on a couple of things, right? The size of the county matters. So a big county is going to be higher than a smaller one. But also the other variable is the um, status or integrity of the natural areas that are left in it. So a county like Monroe, which is up north in the Poconos, and there's a lot of forested land and bogs and, and really sensitive habitat has a huge amount of ecosystem services. Berks County I mentioned is 
is lower, but still pretty high. And then counties that have more development and less forested areas or are smaller tend to come in smaller. But it's just, a, you know, it's not a right or a wrong. It's just an interesting way to look at it. And it helps illustrate um, some of the services and patterns across the region. So the next thing I want to shift to is we have all this great information, but it it's, needs to be useful. It needs to be, we need to put it to work, basically. And that's what these next set of slides are. We really want to make sure that um, it doesn't become a study that sits on a shelf. So we do a lot of work with our stakeholders, with the gr groups we work with. Part of that is engagement. So this slide's showing just a lot of different activities that we do of outreach and increasing awareness to highlight the value and significance of nature. So we, you know, we know it because we've studied that in our groups that we work with know it, but most open space is private land. So we have to get out there and talk to people about the value of their natural system on their property. It's not to say you can't use your property, but some pieces are more important than others. And we need to look at conservation activities for it. So outreach is big. Um, I know I'm too sh a little short on time, so I want to go into GIS part of it. So I've talked about decision support, and that's key here. So we work with land trusts. We work with municipalities, counties. They want to use this information, but they're, they're busy. They have limited resources. So we develop streamlined applications or efficient applications for them to understand what's going on. So the first part of it's mapping. So we, we develop mapping tools. We take our maps out of the desktop. We put them in ArcGIS online. Anybody can get to it. They can zoom in. They can click on things and get information. They can see toggle layers off and on like riparian areas or woodlands or things like that. So the mapping's a big part of it. Um, we also use data visualization tools with, with some of the maps that go with it. It's important to see um, how does this break down? What's the percentage of high priority lands? So we use some of the tools in ArcGIS Online to, to um, measure that. And some of these, if you look down below, it's hard to see, I know there's filters. So if I click that, it's going to refresh all these charts and say, instead of seeing the whole study area, tell me what the value is in, in the um, protected lands part of it or the riparian areas or the forests or whatever we're looking at. So those tools are really useful. Um, they take it away from just numbers that we look at. The numbers are important, but now it becomes something where if a, a development review is going on, we can zoom in and we can look at it. Or if a land trust wants to see where's the most important parcels, because they can't protect every parcel, these tools are really useful to them and they can find out which ones are the greatest ones or the biggest bang for their buck, basically. Since it's mapping, we can also go further with it. Um, we can use the tools, I, I mentioned land cover. So we work with communities and we say, okay, um, you know, we can give you the current values, but if you're interested in restoration um, activities or projects, we can plug these numbers in and then and generate the current values and the potential values. And again, it's a these types of scenario building or what if tools are really popular, really powerful decision making tools. Um, the last slide I'll mention, we also create focused applications. So the, um, the, this one up here, it's called the conservation selector. It's basically like online shopping. If I go to it, if I open it up and it's meant to be really easy to use, I pick different criteria and it shows me the parcels that meet it. Like if I was going to Boscov's and looking for a backpack, I would put in a brand, a backpack, and it would filter through all that and show me the candidates. That's what this does. And it works in like two or three minutes. It's, it's a really cool tool that our uh, customers really like. And the last one's building a site assessment report. So I'm hoping this is online. I can't open them up and show them to you today, but I encourage you, if you can get to it, look at it or go to the Kittatiti Ridge website and see what see how these things work. Uh, lastly, we really think this data is valuable, but it's we need as many people to use it as we can. So we work with the state um, spatial data access, POSDA, 
and working with them to post these layers so many others can use it and have access to it. So I covered a lot in a little time. This is usually an hour long presentation, but I wanted to give you what I could and focus on the GIS parts of it today. Anyone have any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just out of curiosity, what was the source data for your land cover? We use the um, National Land Cover data set. It's not the most detailed, but we want it across the entire state. So we need it to be consistent. Um, we do it, it's updated like every three years. So we started off with 2011, we're up to, it was just released, 2021 20, was just released a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about the parameters for your study, you were saying that you were grouping all woods and the riparians together. Now, when you look at the woods, do you break that down further into like sugar maple mesic, conifers, like, or? Not species type, but the integrity or the ecosystem services are based on the size. Um, so certain species need a, rel like a lot of raptors need really large forested areas. So we break it down by I think it's 750 acres and above is larger. And then medium is 500 to 750 and then smaller or less. So we break it down in those ways. And uh, we also work with Audubon. They're telling us that it's not just the size, it's the how well is it being maintained. Yeah. So we're, we're always looking at refining these models, but we do break it down somewhat, but not into different types of species. I used to do these sort of type of models um, and we used to always do the, like sugar maple mesic forests are always the highest degree of species richness, you know, like and stuff like that. Like the, you, you don't you don't use species richness at all or any. Not in its current form. I mean, if we move away from the mid Atlantic and we move to other areas with different types, we probably are going to need to adjust a lot of that. Um, it's it's a good point. I mean, I'll look at it further and especially with with our other partners and talk about it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is a great, great presentation. Uh, thank you. Great presentation. Um, I think it's very important to put a uh, monetary value on uh, open space in our kind of society. Um, are you lo possibly looking at um, like regional, local impacts or could you expand this to more like, for example, global with carbon storage or like within like a Chesapeake watershed area? So right now, um, there's other agencies that do this and some of them that are doing it much more broader uh, scale. The one thing, it, it gets a little bit challenging when you cross over to other ecosystem types. Like even if we were to move to the coastal areas here, our models would need to be really changed dramatically because of the types of uh, ecosystems that are there. So it's it's something that we want to do and we've had inquiries about moving into other areas. It just would take more than we have right now. And we think we're doing, we work with the conservation landscapes. That's, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but Pennsylvania has about six conservation landscapes. They're the ones who are promoting conservation and pr uh, working with environmental advisory committees and land trusts and things like that. So we're starting off there, but hopefully it's going to, you know, morph into other things down the road. Okay, I think we have one final question. So with your riparian buffer slide, you uh, were showing uh, where there was tree coverage, right, canopy? Right. And then not tree canopy? Right. And then highlighting whether it was like in agri a different land uses. Right. Right. Uh -huh. So I, I think you might have answered this through mentioning the data source of your land use layer. So you said your land use layer was, what was it again? The national national land, land cover data. Set. Right. So I guess that that doesn't go further down into saying uh, agricultural pasture or cropland or anything like that. It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So would you rate something like, uh, you know, a, a herd of cows standing in the middle of a stream as more of a priority than uh, uh, fertilizer runoff or something like that? 
Um, not in our models. I mean, they're not that specific, but we our, our models are great. They give us good numbers. But when we work with different communities, there's always issues that are anecdotal or above the model. And we address them in the reports that we're doing or strategies. Um, the one slide, and, and I, you brought up a good point I should have mentioned, in the repairing areas, there's a great coverage for, that was done for Pennsylvania. It's called Riparian Priority Planting Areas. And that was a, a great scientific study that looked at really detailed areas based on they, were, they didn't have vegetation, the slopes were high, the soils were bad, and it ranked them. So we incorporate data sets like that into it to augment uh, our other data sets. All right, thank you everybody. We're gonna take a quick break.